Hello, I'm Dr. John Cavanaugh, and this is AJS 101 Introduction to Criminal Justice, Lesson 1, Part 1. So let's begin. What is criminal justice? Now, people are concerned with crime because it either directly impacts them, if they're the victims of crime, or indirectly impacts them and society by different manners. Now, think for a second how crime affects you personally, even though you might not be a crime victim. Take a moment to think about that. Well, the first way is that you pay more for things you purchase in stores and sometimes services because of crime. Stores have to add to the price of any product that they sell an additional amount of money to take into account theft, theft by employees, theft by customers, theft by outsiders, uh, and of course the cost of security, uh, cameras, security guards. So that increased cost, which is crime related, is something which we all pay, even though we're not the store owner because it's passed on to us. A second way that you're indirectly affected by crime, or some people are, is that you have to change your behaviors and your lifestyle. Uh, people who live in high crime areas, especially elderly people, well, they might not go out of their apartments because they fear being mugged. Uh, women, not all women, but many women, don't go out at night if there's not someone to be with them. They don't want to go out alone because they might be afraid of being mugged or raped in a parking lot. Uh, this is a extreme degradation of their lifestyle. And the third way that we all indirectly are crime victims is that we all have to, through our taxes, sales tax, personal income tax, property tax, and what have you, we all have to pay the cost to maintain the criminal justice system. We have to pay for police, we have to pay for courts, we have to pay for prisons, jails, probation departments, corrections departments, the buildings, the employees, uh, the supplies. And, and this is a significant cost uh, to the taxpayer. So those are three ways that people are victimized, so to speak, by crime, even though they're not the actual victim of the crime. But let's talk about what is crime. Crime is behavior in violation of the, which law? Criminal, civil, or common law? What do you think? It's easy. Criminal law. Crime was a behavior in violation of the criminal law, and these were laws promulgated by either of the three levels of government that operate in the United States. The three levels of government that operate in the U.S. are the federal government, and what are the other two? What is the next one down? Okay, the state government. Each state has its own criminal laws. And finally, the local government, cities, towns, counties. They also have local laws. So at all levels of government, laws are passed. Criminal laws are passed. They're usually passed by the legislature, which at the federal level will be Congress, the House, and the Senate. Uh, at the state level, it's usually also a, a state House of Representatives and a state Senate, although some states call the their House of Representatives the Assembly. Uh, and finally, uh, at, the, at the county and local level, town councils, county supervisors, they have different titles, uh, city council members. So these are all bodies that create criminal laws. And uh, if you break them, you, you pay the price. So let's talk about how societies control people's behavior. Societies use social control techniques to control crime. Social control is the use of sanctions, which are bad things, and rewards, which are good things, by groups to control the behavior of their members. Now, this is not unique to governments. All groups control their members by rewarding good behavior and punishing bad behavior. Let's give some examples. Uh, Let's talk about, uh, well, first let's begin by talking about rewards for good behavior. Let's think of a non-criminal justice system reward. Think back to when you were in elementary school. If you got a, an A on a test or you, you won the spelling bee, 
the teacher would often reward you. And the way they would do this might be by putting a star on your collar or your name on the board as being top speller. That's a reward for good behavior. And it's given because we want to not only recognize the good behavior, but we want to encourage it in the person who did it and other people who might want to also uh, become the best speller in class. But there's also sanctions for bad behavior. So if you were bad in school, it would be maybe a time out or, or you couldn't uh, engage in some play activity in, in, in the schoolyard. Uh, the same is true in, in your own social groups when you were in school. Uh, if, if you were an idiot and, and, and uh, annoyed people, you were sanctioned. You couldn't hang out with that particular group. They would shun you or they ridicule you. Uh, by the same token, if you uh, were, you know, did socially acceptable things, you behaved the way they want, you would be invited into the group uh, and that is a reward. So social controls, again, are sanctions for good behavior, penalties for bad behavior. We also have, from the, at the government level, we have civil sanctions. Uh, if you park in the wrong spot against the law, you get a civil fine. All right, so that's an example of a non-criminal civil sanction that the government can put upon you. But there are also criminal sanctions. Now, criminal acts are acts that are especially bad, and they have criminal sanctions. Now, the less serious of the criminal sanctions is usually just a fine, uh, but more serious criminal behavior can also get you incarcerated in a jail or even a prison. And in some states, with the death penalty, if you commit a capital offense, if you intentionally murder somebody uh, under aggravating circumstances, you can be executed. So those are criminal sanctions. So let's talk a little bit about indiv individual rights versus public order, because uh, there is a natural conflict or friction between the protection of individual, the individual rights of suspects and the protection of we, the public, against crime. Think about it now. Um, it's much easier to control crime in a police state than to do so in a state that protects the rights of the individual against arbitrary government action and abuse. In, in totalitarian states where the government can do whatever it wants to, if they suspect that a person is anti-government or committed some crime, uh, they could just break into the person's house, search the house against his or her permission to try to find evidence. Uh, I mean, they can do all sorts of brutal things to people who they don't like because there are no individual rights in a totalitarian, totalitarian country or very few. On the other hand, in more civilized societies, we re respect the individual rights of people. In fact, uh, the United States uh, is very respectful of individual rights. We were a colony of England and the individual rights of the colonists were being violated by England. You remember your history, uh, soldiers breaking into colonists' homes and searching for evidence of, of treason, uh, un, you know, unreasonable taxation. So having uh, been oppressed by the British government, the founders of this country uh, had a revolution and in constructing their government, uh, in order to get the Constitution passed, they had to amend it with 10 amendments. And these amendments were pretty much all focused on protecting the individual rights of citizens against the government, because the founders of our country had great distrust of government. They thought governments were potentially oppressive and had to be controlled. And that's why you have the first 10 amendments or the Bill of Rights which protects you against unreasonable searches and seizures of your property, which protects your freedom of speech, your freedom of religion. Uh, all of these things are um, basically uh, individual rights protections. So again, uh, it's a lot easier to control crime in a police state than it is in a state with individual protections against arbitrary action and abuse. Now, we've had these protections in our Constitution, and many state constitutions also add other rights or, or make them stronger. However, prior to the 1960s, American law enforcement agencies had, what do you think, little or much concern for the rights of those suspected of committing uh, or convicted of committing crimes? Do you think prior to the 1960s, law enforcement was very sensitive to individual protections of criminals? No, they had very little concern. 
there were routine unlawful searches. There was the use of force in interrogations. Uh, so prior to the 1960s, the individual rights of, of criminal suspects were really uh, routinely violated. It, it was not a good time. But the 60s came and the 70s, and there was a, a renewed thinking about uh, individual rights and civil liberties and civil rights. And as a result, in the 60s and 70s, the United States Supreme Court expanded the rights of suspects and convicts. This was a court whose chief justice was Earl Warren, and Supreme Courts are usually named in terms of the time period by the chief justice. And this was called the Warren Court, and they instituted a lot of protections of people who are suspected or even convicted of crimes. In fact, the famous Miranda warning, where police have to tell people suspected of crimes of their right to remain silent and not answer questions and their right to have an attorney before they can interrogate them. That came uh, during the 60s and 70s period of renewed uh, interest and respect for civil rights, for uh, individual rights for suspects and convicts. But in the 1980s and 90s, public concern about rising crime rates caused some of these expanded rights to be curtailed. So there was a backlash against all the crime uh, and the crime increased for a number of reasons, not necessarily uh, specifically related to making it harder to arrest people because of the greater uh, concern with individual rights of criminals and suspects. Uh, there were other factors. You know, one of the biggest factors that determines how much crime you have is the number of people in the population that are in the crime prone years. The number of people who are between roughly 18 and 30 years old because they commit a lot of the street crime that people are concerned about. And economic factors are, are also there. But it, regardless, in the 80s and 90s, crime went up, people were concerned, and some of the, uh, th there were some new court decisions and new laws passed, which reduced the, uh, some of the gains made by the Warren Court in the 60s and 70s. Now, you've got two types of people. You have individual rights advocates, and you have public order advocates. Now, the individual rights advocates, and these are sometimes called civil libertarians. Uh, individual rights are called civil liberties. Uh, so individual rights advocates are usually called civil libertarians. And these people emphasize personal freedom and protection from government control. Uh, they want to maximize your freedom, which means they oppose laws which they think unnecessarily uh, restrict what you can do, uh, and they also are very suspicious of law enforcement and government prosecutorial power. So they try to protect you from uh, overreach by the government. Uh, individual rights advocates tend to be political, what do you think, liberals or conservatives? Okay. They tend to be political liberals, like the American Civil Liberties Union is an example of a civil liberties group. On the other side of the spectrum are your public order advocates. And these are people that advocate for law and order, very popular phrase. They emphasize public safety from criminals over personal liberties. So your public order advocates, they tend to be conservatives. Uh, and there's a battle going on between the two. Uh, on the one hand, people say, you know, you need, we need to be protected from being mugged, raped, and robbed, and our, and our, and our homes burglarized, and our property destroyed and, uh, on the streets. And other people say, no, no, you, you can't go overboard trying to stop this behavior and violate people's rights. Uh, so there's a back and forth, and this is, is political, and it also is in the court system. <clears throat> uh, and in reality, the, the, the real position is probably somewhere in the middle, as it is with most things. You know, maybe you simply want uh, public order advocates who also have a deep respect for uh, civil liberties and, and don't go overboard in unleashing the police and the prosecutors to control criminals. All right, let's talk about the criminal justice system, which is really the main topic of this course. So the following agencies make up the criminal justice system, and, and we'll do this kind of in order of, of where they step into the process. So who enforces the law? This is pretty easy. The police. The police are the ones who enforce the law. Once a person is arrested, uh, who determines guilt or innocence 
and who gives a sentence to the guilty person? The courts. Right? The courts determine guilt or innocence and sentence the guilty. Now, if a person is, did something fairly serious, uh, then they may wind up being incarcerated in a jail or prison. And the corrections department, they operate the jails and prisons. Uh, now, corrections, I guess, is kind of a misnomer because we really don't do that much rehabilitation in, in prisons and jails. Uh, two main reasons are, A, it's kind of hard to change people's behavior, and B, we often don't fund uh, rehabilitation programs uh, to, the, to the point where they, they have enough time and, and resources to do a really good job. But in any event, so the Corrections Department operates jails and prisons, and they do that for the purposes of incarcerating those convicted of crimes. So if you've been convicted of a crime and incarceration is in order because it was serious or a moderate crime, but you have uh, other histories of conviction showing that you're kind of a bad guy or gal, uh, then you're going to be incarcerated. You go to the Corrections Department. You're going to go to a jail if your sentence is a year or less. You're going to go to a prison if it's over a year. But the Corrections Department also operates for the purposes of detaining those accused of committing crimes who cannot make bail or were not given the option of bail or release on their own recognizance. So if you've been accused of a crime, you usually have an initial hearing before a judge. And one of the things that the judge will do is decide uh, where you're going to be hanging out uh, while this case is adjudicated. So some people are released on their own recognizance. Uh, these are usually people who did not commit serious crimes and, and do not have a history of not showing up for court appearances. So that's ROR, released on own recognizance, and you're just released on your own promise to return on your next court date. Other people uh, might be allowed to make bail. And as we'll learn later on, with bail, you have to put up money or a bond that you get from a private company, a bail's bond company, uh, and you have to pay them to, to put the bond up. But it's putting up some sort of money or a bond to the court, uh, and if you don't show up when you're supposed to, that money is forfeited to the court. So the idea being you'll show up because you don't want to lose the money. Uh, although there would be some people who are not given the option of bail and are not released on their own recognizance. And these are people who commit extremely serious crimes usually, uh, or people who have a high risk of fleeing and not coming to court, or people who are considered dangerous. Uh, so they would not get bail and they would have to basically sit in prison until their case is called. We also have the probation department. And the probation department prepares pre-sentence reports for judges and it also supervises and assists those found guilty of offenses, but who are placed on probation instead of being sent to jail or prison. If the crime committed is uh, serious where a fine alone is not adequate, but not so serious that you want to put the person in jail or prison, then very often they will uh, send the person to the probation department to serve a period of probation, you know, six months, a year, two years. And probation basically involves, you're supervised by a probation officer, you have restrictions on uh, what you can do. Usually, you know, you can't ha hang out with criminals, you can't break the law again. Uh, if you have special problems, you're required to deal with them, you know, going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings or drug rehabilitation. Uh, that's all supervised by a probation officer. Uh, by the way, probation officers also prepare pre-sentence reports for judges. If the case didn't involve a plea bargain where the sentence was negotiated between the prosecutor, the defense attorney, and the um, judge, then uh, the judge has to decide within the sentencing parameters of the crime that you committed uh, how, what sentence to give you. Uh, to get information to assist that, probation officers will do research on the backgrounds of people who have been convicted. Uh, in terms of their employment history, their criminal history, maybe interview some people to see you know, if they're good or bad per persons. Uh, and they'll give a report to the judge to aid the judge on whether to go lenient or strict. And finally, there's the parole department, and that supervises and assists those released early from prison. Um, if you committed a really serious crime and you went to prison, very often if you behave reasonably well in prison, uh, after a certain amount of time, a parole board will look at your record in prison 
and determine whether or not you should be placed on parole. And that means you're released early from prison, but you're also under the supervision of a parole officer and you have to obey certain conditions. Uh, it's very much like probation, but after you get out of prison. Uh, so those are the parts of the criminal justice system. But those are the parts. Let's look at the process, the, the activities of the system. The criminal justice system is called a system because it is made up of separate parts or agencies that make up its whole. And the parts all interact with each other. In addition, the actions of one part can affect other parts. Uh, so that's why we call it a system, right? It's different parts and they work together towards some final goal. And what one part does can affect the operations of another part. Let me give you an example uh, of a system. Uh, one would be uh, your digestive system in your body. Right? That's made up of separate parts, your mouth, stomach, uh, large intestine, small intestine, you know, anus. Uh, those are all parts that work together for the purposes of digesting food and extracting nutrition from it. Now, these parts are a system because they all work towards the same common goal, uh, and they also affect each other. If your mouth eats too much or eats too fast, you'll upset the stomach and it'll get upset and maybe you'll throw up. All right? uh, so in, in that respect, what happens in one part can affect another part. Um, so let's take a look at the criminal justice system. Uh, again, you have the police, you have the courts, part of the courts are probation, you have the corrections department and part of corrections is parole. So you have the five parts of the criminal justice system, and let's see how they, they work. Now, they're supposed to coordinate their efforts to accomplish the system's goals, but they usually do or do not coordinate their activities. They usually don't. They usually don't work together, which disrupts the system, much like if the mouth overeats and overloads the stomach, uh, so too can you have a lack of coordination in the criminal justice system. For instance, if on a Friday night, the police decide to do a massive sweep of the streets and round up prostitutes and drug dealers, and they make a whole lot of arrests over the weekend, when the courts open on Monday, the courts will be overwhelmed for the initial hearing process and will wind up totally overcrowded and bogged down and not functional or misfunctional. Uh, that's because there's no coordination. Uh, supposing the judges all got upset because they said people accuse us of being lenient on, on defendants and that's why there's crime in the streets. Uh, hypothetically, suppose they all decided to give everybody maximums. Well, after, you know, six months or a year, the, 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 the jail and prison system would be overloaded with prisoners. There'd be overcrowding, there'd be disorder, there'd be problems. There would be no coordination. Uh, if the probation department doesn't rehabilitate and supervise a, a, a probationer properly, that probationer will break the law and wind up back in the police system, going through the system again. Uh, so as you can see, these parts are all supposed to work together for some common goals, right? They're supposed to punish the guilty. They're supposed to do some reform. Uh, they're also supposed to incapacitate dangerous people. Uh, some repeat offenders, uh, violent offenders who are very dangerous and, and have a high risk of repeating are often given very long sentences so they stay incarcerated uh, and can't harm people on the streets and in society. That's called incapacitation and that's another function of the criminal justice system. So again, these are the parts of the criminal justice system. We discussed uh, what each does, we discussed how they're supposed to operate together, which is why we call them a system. And with that, that is the end of part one of lesson one. So uh, you now can go on to lesson one, part two, and we'll continue our chapter one topics.